Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another one of the Foundation's Conversations at Home. My name is Liz, and I'm excited to be joined today by Madeleine Patch. You know her as Riverdale's resident femme fatale, Cheryl Blossom. Madeleine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I want to take a second before we start to remind everyone that the sag After Foundation is currently raising money for a COVID-19 fund to help sag After members being affected by the closed productions and who are currently out of work. If you need help, ask, and if you can help, please give. More information can be found in the comments below this video. Now, Madeline, how are you handling your quarantine? You know, I think I'm getting into a good rhythm with it, which is such a, it's such a weird time that we're living in. So of course I have my ups and my downs, but my therapist is my new best friend. So that's great. I see on social media that you've been doing lots of crafts. What inspired you there? I think it's, um, you know, my job is so creative and I, I feel like I have to fulfill my artist in a different way now. So I've been trying to find different crafts. Like I picked up gel nails. Now I can do my nails. Like just things like that to make me feel creatively fulfilled. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do. And also why not pick up a new skill or two? I love that. I'm glad to hear you're handling it well. <laughs> I'm like living my best life. This is what I do anyways. <laughs> Since the foundation's main audience is SAG After members, I'm curious, how did you first get into acting and how did you get your SAG card? Oh my god, my SAG card. I was tapped heart lead for a Honda commercial. <laughs> I remember it so well. I was so excited. Are um, either of your parents in the arts and what did they say when you expressed your desire to move to LA to pursue acting? I have the world's best parents, truly. And um, they both have a band like that they just do in their own time. So I grew up with a music room is what they call it. So it has like a little recording studio and lots of instruments. And they always encouraged me to go in that world. And I was like, nah, I want to be an actress. And so I was a dancer for a long time. And then I think they kind of knew at like age six or seven that there was nothing else that would make me happy. And so they kind of always prepared for it. And then when I graduated high school, I moved here and they helped me financially. And it was never really a question. They were always very supportive. That's incredible. Yeah. You've spoken a lot in the past about the number of survival jobs you worked before booking Riverdale. What advice would you give to actors working, um, who are watching this and who are waiting for that career changing opportunity? I've never heard survival job. That's funny. I like that. Um, I think the first thing that I want to say is the, I hate so much when people used to say to me, oh, you're an actress. What else do you do? And I think that's such a degrading term. And so I had to really work around building a backbone against that. So, I mean, I'm sure they've all experienced that. Like, try not to let that affect you. You are still an actor, first and foremost. You are just paying your bills. It's so stupid that people even judge you for that. Like, we all have to pay our bills. Um, and another thing is try not to lose the passion and find things that can fill your artists in other ways so that you, when you go into an audition room, you don't have the desperation and the need for it. And you can just kind of sit into the audition. I feel like that was really important to me. It was feeling creatively fulfilled enough in my personal life that I could go into an audition, love the character I've created, whether or not they love her or not, and then walk out. That's great. That's really great advice. What um, advice would you give to actors right now who are at home looking for ways to stretch their creative muscles? That's a great question. I actually want to start doing masterclass. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yes, I'm like dying to start this. And I think there are so many different ways. My old acting studio is doing online classes now. I think there are a lot of ways to kind of, again, feed that artist inside of you online right now. I think we're all finding ways. Watching videos like this could be great. Um, but like picking up new hobbies. And I think the thing about being an actor is we are artists innately. And so doing anything that makes you feel creative will feed that part of your soul, I think. Yeah, it's a, I think possibly a great time for actors to pad out their special skills section on their resume. <laughs> Exactly, like go pick up a language. I mean, I'm being so hypocritical. I'm not doing any of those things, but like go pick up a language, get a bow and arrow. <laughs> like, I don't know, pick up something cool, a guitar, whatever. The point is the opportunities are there if you choose to look for them. 100%. So how did you first get involved with Riverdale? I was driving to my personal assisting job. I'm telling you this story way too long, but I'll, I'll shorten it. Uh, I got a call for an audition for another show to be a guest star on a CW show. And I went immediately, which sometimes happens and is the worst, but whatever. Um, so I go there in my work clothes and I read for the associate and she was like, can you come back later today for producers? So I did. And the producers happened to be some of the same people who were involved in Riverdale. And immediately they were like, this is not for you. We have a pilot we're shooting. I can't give you any more information than that, but I will send you the script in a couple of days and you can audition for a different character because your character doesn't have sides yet. So pretty quickly after that, I think three days later, it was a Monday on a Thursday, I got a call to read for Betty. 
I was very confused. They gave me no information. I didn't know who Cheryl was. Uh, I went in, I read for Betty thinking I was going out for Betty Cooper and then was pinned for an alternative role they never told me about for months. Wild. So they just kept it secret because they didn't want to give the details out of who Cheryl was or had they, was they, not, actually, they weren't what? focusing on her. So they were like, we want to keep her because we think that this literally is Cheryl. So we're just going to keep Madeline here and pinned and we'll give her all the information later. So that was in October. And I think in January, I found out who Cheryl was. Wow. Yeah. Now, was singing and dancing initially part of the audition, or did those aspects of the characters come later? So the only person who sang was Josie's character. Everyone else just went in and auditioned as an actor, and then kind of Roberto got lucky, and we all like to do that. Yeah, I was going to say that you, you all just miraculously could sing, and then the musical episodes, which we will definitely talk about in a minute, came to fruition. Yeah, it's so crazy. I don't know how it worked. I remember he called me season two and was like, lady, can you sing? I was like, yeah, I mean, let's go, whatever. He's like, you're cool with that? And I said, yeah. And he's like, all right, here's our musical. You're the lead. I said, great, let's do it. Wow, now that is cool. <laughs> how much of the story, did, um, how much of Cheryl's story did you get up front? And how many meta- details do you get in advance of the scripts? It depends on the season, the day, and the storyline. I feel like in the beginning, I got the pilot episode, which we all know. Um, and then it was so fantastic. And I know I was so spoiled, but Roberto sat down with each of us after the pilot and said, what do you want to see Cheryl do in season one? What, after playing her for 30 days, like, what do you think she would do at school? How would she handle in this situation? What special skills would she have? Let's talk about her personal life. And so we came up with her being an archer at that point. We came up with her being lesbian at that point. Like we had all these really good conversations about who she was innately as a human being. And he really took my thoughts into consideration. So a lot of the character building we did together, which is fantastic. Now, when it comes to details and stuff that we should know about the show, I learn it when I get a script, which is like four days before we start shooting. Are you an archer? Is that something you brought to the character? Or was it just something you would come up with for Cheryl? Well, I felt like Cheryl would have some ridiculous skill. And I was like, what would be ridiculous? And what do I want to learn? And I was like, archery is always something that I've wanted to learn. So I said archery and he put me through lessons. That's a great opportunity. <laughs> Cheryl? is bold, headstrong, incredibly confident. But when we first meet her, she's reeling from the loss of her brother, her favorite person. How did you first approach the character and bring in all those different aspects? You know, I was, I struggled with her for a bit. I feel like when you first read, when I first read the pilot script, she was just kind of on the page, a mean girl, right? Other than that first opening scene, she was innately just the mean girl. And I wanted to build up all of the things that made her that way before I even focused on that, like that was on the back burner for me. It was all about the facade because it's so obvious to me that she's got this facade that's cracking throughout the entire first season. So it was important to me to figure out what her home life was like, her relationship with her parents. Why was Jason so important to her and build up all those relationships before anything. And then the mean girl thing just kind of came along with all of those things. I didn't even really focus on that. Um, But Jason, you know, it's funny when we just, we were like, okay, obviously Cheryl's a lesbian her mom didn't want her to be. And her mom pushed that part of herself down, which is why she doesn't like her mom. And Jason knew that and was a confidant in that and supported her in that. And that's why he was so important to her. And so when we built all these things up, it made sense why she was so devastated. It made sense why she had the facade. It made sense why she didn't love herself and why she treated people badly. So I think that's what was so important to me is working on her insides before I worked on what she actually showed the world, her mask. That's great. In what ways are you similar and different from Cheryl? Oh, I like love to hate this question. Um, (laughs) I think Cheryl, especially in the first couple of seasons, is the girl who doesn't know her place in the world, is incredibly lost and lonely and just trying to figure out who she is. And I struggled with that throughout my entire high school. And so I feel like her and I can relate in that way and I can kind of sit into her and get in through her with that. Um, obviously a lot of the differences revolve around the way that she treats other people. (laughs) That's not really what I like to do, but I think season three ish and season four a lot, she's working on being more vulnerable and she's still herself. Like she's still that spicy character and I'm very feisty. So that works. Um, but she's also kind of working on being more vulnerable and open. And I think being in a relationship and falling in love really helped with that. You've used YouTube and social media to show your fans that you are quite different from Cheryl Blossom. What inspired that? Well, this is such a weird story, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate. I didn't have Twitter really at all before the show, and so when I got it, I didn't really understand that there was going to be a lot of keyboard warriors in a positive way, but then also in a negative way, 
And I didn't really build that up first. So I spent a lot of nights crying about people calling me names, calling me mean, um, and not being able to differentiate between Madeline and Cheryl, which I think still happens, of course, because people are so invested in the show. And that's something that I can now look at and think is beautiful, that we've created these characters that people can be so invested in. But before I was like, oh my God, everyone hates me. Everyone thinks I'm a bitch. Everyone thinks I'm mean. And they would phrase things to me as if they thought I had done that to Betty or I had done this to whoever. And so I was like, I need to differentiate. How do I do this? And so I talked to my team. I was like, what do we do? How do I do this? And it felt very like trapped. And then I was like, well, I was a photo editor. So I feel like I could edit videos and why don't we just, let's try YouTube. And so we tried YouTube. I was going to put out a couple of videos and then forget about it. And I fell in love with editing, honestly, and the connection it brings to fans. That is really cool. So you were also a competitive dancer growing up. Is it fun to be able to bring aspects of that to Cheryl as a cheerleader and through the musical numbers? It's very fun to be able to do stuff like that. And it's very fun. Like the best part of the musical episodes, I'm skipping ahead, but is the rehearsals and all the time we spend together learning the pieces and learning the numbers. And we've got a fantastic choreographer. So it's just fun to be able to do different things on our show. You're actually not skipping ahead. That leads in perfectly to my next question. Last night's episode was in fact the season's annual musical. What's been your favorite number overall to shoot? Oh my God, Wig in the Box. I don't know if you actually got to see it last night, but Wig in the Box, it was so fun to shoot because again, it's like, it's so strange. Season one, I feel like we all worked together so much. And then we all had our own storylines that branched off. And it was one of those moments where we were all together. We had so much fun. It took like four days to shoot that, that musical number and doing the wigs and the crazy hair. And it was, it was so fun to just dive into that and do something different again. With who, my friends. who doesn't love a good makeover montage? A hundred percent. And also who doesn't like, I want to see what, what I'm going to look like with short silver hair. Like why not? <laughs> right. Yeah. In last night's episode, we, shot, we saw Cheryl go once again head-to-head -head with Principal Honey. Will he continue to be a foil for her throughout the senior year? And how does he continue to challenge her? I love Principal Honey, first and foremost. Um, he is a challenge. It's The storyline with Honey that's coming up is so good and delicious and exciting. I think people are really going to like it, especially um, kind of towards the very end of what we've shot. Uh, I like that she has... A competitor and also you know what I love about Honey is that he comes in as an adult and is like why are the children running this town this is bizarre which is what everyone's been thinking since season one but finally adult comes in and says this is not how this should be done so I, I like that she's got this person who kind of challenges her in that way and brings back the sass and the fire of Cheryl that I love but in a more I wouldn't say constructive because I don't want people to go off and like bully their present their principles but I think a uh, more healthy way versus doing it to her peers. So I feel like it's a good outlet for her in a weird way. He's kind of portrayed as a villain, but then he comes in and says to you, and like last night's episode, did you even hear the words that you're singing? So it kind of makes you step back and. Yeah, I feel like he's, honestly, he feels like a villain because he's not letting the kids do what they want, but in reality, he's just being a principal. Yeah. What musical would you love to see them do next on Riverdale? And will we be seeing annual musicals now that the characters will not necessarily be in high school? That's a question I don't know the answer to. I mean, I know Roberto loves doing them, so I feel like he would for sure continue them, but uh, I would love to see Sweeney Todd. I think that'd be really fun. That would be incredible. It's so in line with, with Riverdale and Roberto and stuff, too. Well, and I think there's room for it because it's not necessarily always tied to a stage production. Like this year, it was the variety show, and they integrate the songs throughout the performances and the storylines of the characters, so there could always open the door for that. For sure. I'll tell him. Good, good. We all want to see it. We all want to see more music. It's fun. We like it. I bet. So Cheryl starts out as a villainous character, but over time we see the hardship she has faced and in some, in many ways that strips away the facade as she warms to the other characters. What aspects of Cheryl do you have the most fun playing as an actor? Oh man, I can't pick. I, I love them all. That's my favorite thing about Cheryl is the layers. I feel like a lot of these mean girl archetypes that you see in television are just that, they're archetypes. And with Cheryl, there's layers. And every human being has like a million things going on beneath the surface at any given moment. And that's what Cheryl is. I think she's such a great representation of what a human being is. Um, I love when she's having mental breakdowns and she's, she's sobbing and she's emotional. I love when she's a supportive girlfriend and she's all in and loves Tony. I love how much she loves Tony and admires her. And I love when she's being her feisty, sassy self or her one-liners. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a part of Cheryl that I didn't love. That's great. Yeah, I'm her biggest fan. 
<laughs> Good. You, you have to be, you have to be because you embody her bones and, you know, have to experience that. Yeah. We see that Cheryl is always, or not always, but pretty constantly stirring the pot. Is that a defense mechanism because of the trauma she's faced or is it a simply a love of drama? I think it's a healthy mix of both. I think it depends on who she's stirring the pot with. There are times when I think it's a deflection and she's using it as a defense mechanism because of what's going on in her own life and wanting to just focus on somebody else. But I think there's also a part of her that just loves mischief. I mean, in the first episode, you see her say, I'm in the mood for chaos. And she like puts a whole thing with Veronica, Betty, and Archie just to cause trouble. Speaking of I'm in the mood for chaos, Cheryl has had some truly iconic lines and moments. What one stands out is a fun one for you. I'm in the mood for chaos is a favorite, but I think, hmm, I love when I call Jughead a hobo. I go, that was a joke, you hobo. I just think she's, I mean, everything she does is, is funny. Oh, I love when I call, um, I think it's in episode 11, season one. I know I was still living with Lily, Lily because she kept correcting me about how to say baked potato. I don't even know how to tell it. It's such a weird story. But um, I love when I say you two have the combined vocabulary of a baked potato. That's, that's, a, that's another great one. That's a great one. <laughs> Cheryl is someone who's experienced great amounts of pain and loss in her life. Does she carry it around with her or does she try more to live in the moment? Oh, she 100% carries around with her. I think that's almost like what has made her so bitter through the years. I think it actually is what made her so bitter through the years. But I think it's also what makes her such a strong female character and a fighter is that she can still be resilient in the face of all of those things. Um, but that's, I think that's her biggest flaw would be that she carries those things around and she can't let go of stuff at all. Was there a specific moment that was particularly tough for you to shoot? Yeah, there were a couple. Um, physically, I think the... The underwater stuff in season one was very hard. It was about 16 hours in a giant shipping container filled with water. <laughs> wow. Um, that was physically challenging. Mentally, I think the, all of the stuff around coming out was so important to me to, to represent properly and with respect and also to feel real. So there, was, there were a lot, of, a lot of conversations and a lot of talk and a lot of really careful consideration going into that storyline. And I think that was very hard. The gay conversion therapy was tr was traumatic for her and and hard to shoot. Um, you know, losing her brother the season the season four stuff where she's got her brother in her basement that was hard to shoot because you know I have a brother so of course I'm kind of delving into that and it's you watching her have a full blown psychotic break right in front of you. Um, so all of those things were hard in a sense where it was it was taxing but they were important. What has it meant to you to be able to play a character that goes through those relatable hardships, such as struggling with sexual identity, loss of family, but is able to put a smile on at the end of her face and live her best life? That is one of the most important things to me. And that's what I'm so grateful for on Riverdale is that it's, it's so important to all of us to represent all walks of life. And I'm very honored and grateful that there are, you know, lesbian relationships on television. I don't remember any when I was a kid and TV shows that I'd be watching at 11 to 14 or whatever. And so it was really important to me that there, everyone feels like they have somebody they can identify with and that they can, they can kind of look to for their struggles and feel like they're not alone. That's very important to me. Were there any scenes that you loved that you shot that didn't make it into the final cuts of the show? Yes, there's so many. Oh my God. Um, my favorite being You Shine, which was a duet that Tony and Cheryl sang in season two. Season two, I think. Um, but there's so many scenes that get cut. It's crazy. Whole storylines will get cut. I mean, we have anywhere between 60 to 70 page scripts. And if you kind of budget one minute per page and we're 42 minutes of a show, a whole heck of a lot gets cut. But a third of the show. Pardon? A third of the show. Yeah, about a third of the show gets cut. We've gotten a lot better about speaking a little quicker so we can get more out. Um, but ultimately it, a lot of things get cut, but it always seems to make sense. And then they release it. Like we did a blooper reel for season two and I'd say probably 50% of it was my, was my character. Are there any particular fun ones that you want to give the fans that you wish they could have seen? Oh, there's one I wish they would never have seen. Um, <laughs> <I'm too. laughs> I too. That's the first thing that popped into my head. There was a scene where I dress up in lingerie when my mother has kind of like, was working as a woman of the night in the house in season two. And I dress up in lingerie and like kind of, try to seduce the man, but only to like make her upset. 
And it, I was so happy they cut it, but then I was so unhappy that they released it. I was like, no, this should just be dead. It should never be seen again. This doesn't make any sense. Um, but that's out there in the world if you want to see it. Tune in, have a laugh. It makes no sense. You mentioned Tony a minute ago, and I definitely want to mention Cheryl's relationship with the wonderful Tony Topaz. How has Tony pro proven to be a stabilizing force in Cheryl's life? She is the stabilizing force in Cheryl's life, I think. And it's so beautiful that, like, I think it's uh, so indicative of what love really does to somebody, but to show the vulnerable nature of a human being. And when you fall in love, like, I think it's just so real. Like, it, it brings the best parts of Cheryl out, and that's what a, a good partner does. And I absolutely adore them together and love them together, and I'm their biggest fan, and uh, it's really beautiful. The one thing that I wish we were able to delve into more is how it enriches Tony's life in any way, because it definitely enriches Cheryl's life, but Cheryl's such a handful that I'd like to see Cheryl do things to make Tony feel good and feel like she's supported, but it's a lot of Tony just really lifting Cheryl up, which is, again, the sign of a great partner who just loves endlessly and unconditionally. Other than allowing Cheryl to explore her sexuality, what other ways is Tony different from any relationship, including non-romantic or sexual, that Cheryl has had in the past? I think it's that Tony really sees her. She really sees every single side of Cheryl and loves unconditionally every side of Cheryl. And that's something that Cheryl's never felt, even in a mom or a dad. And so to feel like, wow, this person sees every part of me and truly loves me is something she's never experienced before, sadly. Next season, we presumably see the characters go off to college. How will that affect the format and structure of the show? Well, <laughs> I can't really say anything. It'll be good. That's all I can say. It's going to be good. It's going it, to, it'll, it'll be different. I think it's the shift that we need. Awesome. In, in a perfect world, where would you like to see Cheryl end up? Not in Riverdale. It's too toxic there. She needs to get out. Um, I, my hope would be that she stays with Tony. I, I really, I would have liked to see Heather come back, her first love, and I would have liked to see a little bit of that dynamic of her kind of getting over that and healing that wound. But I, I would really like to see her with Tony still. Um, I feel like Cheryl would be a fantastic lawyer. I'd love to see her be a lawyer or something like that because she's a damn good arguer. Uh, but other than that, I have no idea. Maybe New York? That would be a good one. Maybe a potential Katie Keene tie-in down the road? Here we go. Exactly. Which airs tonight. Um, people are watching it, but for us. <laughs> you are outspoken about the fact that you are vegan. Can you share a little bit about why environmental consciousness and sustainability is crucial? It's so funny. I was raised vegan and my parents are so environmentally conscious that it was kind of ingrained in me. And I, I don't, I take that as a blessing. I know how lucky I am to have been raised with that. Um, if we continue at the rate that we're going right now with carbon emissions, our planet will be destroyed and we'll have irreversible damage to it in the next 10 years that we can never fix again. It's very important to me to spread awareness about that in a, in a positive way so that people don't feel like I'm shoving anything down their throats and they can digest that information in a way that makes them feel inspired and not attacked. So I, I really, I try hard to spread the, the message of trying to reduce how much meat you eat so that there's less of a supply for it or a demand for it so there's less supply so that there's less carbon emissions. And so there's things like that that people can do in their day-to-day -day life, just being a little bit more conscious that could severely help the planet in a positive way. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. I want to remind everyone that Riverdale airs Wednesday nights on The CW. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Liz.